I did the Air Force. I didn't really like being in the military, but you learn to uh, take a lot of uh, crap from people. If it's not relevant, you just you learn how to let go of that. Work, work will never end uh, unless you quit or die. <laughs> I always had a pretty high opinion of myself, so I thought, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I have, to, I can bring some business savvy <laughs> into this. With some things, you need to do the same things over and over again and put in the hard work. So it took a long time for me to learn to work hard. Just potential is not enough if it's not uh, fulfilled and, and the way to fulfill it is to... Welcome to Sports and Outdoor Mentors. In this episode, I chat to David Eckerland, the co-founder and CEO of Icebug. Icebug is a footwear brand that's renowned for minimizing their negative environmental impact. They employ 50 people and in 2022 generated approximately 30 million euros of sales. I chat with David about the challenges of founding and leading a family-run business, around his inspirational approach to people leadership, and how they're leading the way in transforming the outdoor industry to be more sustainable. Before we jump into the episode, I have one favor to ask. Please hit the subscribe button. This helps the channel massively by enabling us to continue to elevate the content and attract more guests to share their amazing insights with you. So let's get into the episode. I hope you enjoy it and I'll see you soon. David, looking back over your life to date, what are the defining factors, the defining moments that led to where you are today? I mean, obviously being born into a pretty wealthy part of the world where uh, outdoor activities or nature has always been close by. I think that's an important part and having a lot of possibilities through uh, free education, both high quality school and through uh, university. Uh, and then, you know, serendipity, starting some stuff with my mother that I never thought I would do. And then there's also been some bigger events that led, led to inner development. I think that uh, uh, first hearing about Earth Overshoot Day was one such time. Uh, and then when there was a real when the effect of the climate crisis was felt here for the first time, when we had a summer without uh, any rains and lots of forest fires. And then I think the pandemic was also a very um, life-changing uh, event or series of events or situation uh, for me. As obviously you're aware, I mean, most people that work in the outdoor industry have a fundamental passion to be outdoors. Um, and I know for you, let's say your your main passion or biggest passion, maybe is a better way to try, but I think is skiing, but I know you yeah. also run and mountain bike, kayak, practice yoga. But before you kind of got into all those sports, I think as a kid, you used to play in forests like the ones that we, we surround us today. So would you say that was somehow the, the catalyst for you at a very early age of loving to be outdoors and loving the out, outside? Yeah, I think there are two different things here. One is things that you kind of do as activities. Uh, so I also started skiing at a very early age. I think it was four uh, the first time uh, I was uh, in the Alps. But the other part, which is more as an integrated part in everyday life, more or less, because I grew up in a pretty urban area, but still very close to the forest. We always spent a lot of time there and and that wasn't really outdoor activity. That was just being outside. Uh, so I think that I didn't quite understand how much that influenced me and was a part of uh, who I am. It kind of this everyday being outdoors uh, thing um, un until it was this time when when the forest here felt that it was, you know, really not uh, in very good shape when it was a big uh, drought. Uh, and then I realized, in fact, I grew up just about 10K hike through the forest. So it's basically the same forest I've lived, I mean, in, in a few different uh, places outside as well. But I came back to basically the same forest and I hadn't really realized that. Uh, because if you drive around, it's a little bit longer. But if you hike through it, it's, it's only 10K. And the idea of this, uh, you know, the forest that I always took for granted, that it would maybe not be around 
for me and for my kids and for future generations that was a very tough thing to to take in so after those early years when you studied i think you studied um philosophy initially um in gothenburg so not too far away uh and then you switched to journalism um Maybe you can touch a little bit on why you switched. I think there's maybe a, an interesting anecdote, funny story there. But also you studied in Spain for a little while as well. So I, I'm interested, first of all, is there anything through those years, through those studies that you were able to kind of take and practically use then in later life in, in running Icebug today? And also what the value for you of of spending time in Spain was and if you felt that was... Yeah, if you felt that was a value to you. Starting with philosophy, uh, I think that that was the first subject I studied at university. And I think it's excellent in the sense that uh, this gives you a lot of tool for thinking and to analyze what is a real problem and what is kind of a pseudo uh, problem. So I think that was the best aspect that I got from philosophy at that time. Maybe I got some seeds that would uh, uh, grow later in terms of philosophy as a, as a way of approaching how to live a good life. At that time I was mostly interested in the, uh, in the analytical part, but after a while I, I kind of uh, get a little bit fed up with you know asking does the world exist or not <laughs> and decided to, um, I want to be a little bit more practical in uh you know i think the world exists so i want to be a little bit more practical in how i can affect uh, this world and then i did military service uh, and after that i uh, i went to uh, to journalism as i saw as a way of trying to um, have some influence on on positive development in the world interesting no i, I wasn't aware you did military service so yeah, what did you take away from that experience anything or yeah it was mandatory at that time uh, of course you could do uh, non um, well without weapons some kind of civil service uh, but i think i had a fundamental uh belief that you know sweden should have a, a a defense and if i think that's the right thing to do then i need need to do my part uh, which is a little bit similar to like the sustainable transformation if i think that something is right for for the world i have to take that in and work that way in inside the company as well um but yeah, I didn't really like, uh, I did the Air Force. I didn't really like uh, uh, being in the military. But you learn to, uh, you know, take a lot of uh, crap from people. Yeah. And, and, you know, just if it's not relevant, you just, you learn how to let go of okay. that. So that that was a good <laughs> learning. Absolutely. I don't know if it was worth 11 months of my life, though. <laughs> but still, it, it's a good learning that you can use in in future life as yeah. well interesting and then as you said you you moved into journalism um and then i think you were you did various different freelance work as a journalist for i think four to five years if i if i know yeah i think no i think it became a little bit shorter and i yeah. did uh so the way that that the job market for journalists uh, looked back then was that you you go into being a substitute in a newspaper or in another uh, media outlet because there were you know number of journalism jobs was declining and and uh, and the union was still strong so you could do as a temporary for 11 months but if you do more than that uh, then they had to offer you a, a fixed position next time they had a, an open position and they never wanted to do that so basically how the job market worked was that people moved from place to place doing 11 months in one place and then 11 months in another place so at the end of my first let's say this 11 uh, months stint when I was going to be kicked out from uh, from uh, the newspaper where I worked. Uh, I had the option to go to the other, which was more a daily newspaper in, in, in the same city, or go to Stockholm, which is a main um, area for, for journalism. And I worked in something like uh, the Yellow Press, okay. 
which is fun work. It's a, it's a, it's a good craft, but it's also really pushes all, uh, all, or at least for me, it pushed all my cynical buttons. Okay. So, really? so yeah, because uh, real good stuff uh, from uh, from uh, selling, uh, uh, you know, uh, newspaper copies point of view is when it happens really bad yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was like, you know, should I go to Stockholm and do the same thing? I don't know. Uh, and when it comes to journalism, it's one of those uh, professions where uh, you have a few uh, really high profile jobs, which are the reason why you, you want to go into new journalism. But then you realize that the, the, really the majority of journalists, they, they have a, a, a different job uh, than, than those most uh, profile or prominent ones uh, so it was around this time that my mother who is uh, who was very established uh, sportswear and then footwear designer uh, her best supplier from uh, from Taiwan and they asked her if, if she didn't want to start a company with them to uh, cater for the Scandinavian market doing design mm -hmm. uh, and product development and production for different Scandinavian brands and, and in-house labels. And she kind of described this as an opportunity, but she was unsure if she, you know, would be able to do it alone. And then I figured, okay, so I'll, I'll, uh, I always had a pretty high opinion of myself. So I thought, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I have, I can bring some business savvy <laughs> into this because she always been very good at commercial design and made a lot of other people rich. So I thought, yeah, bring some some savvy into this, and you know, we'll do a few years. And uh, I, I formed a company then called MDP, as in Million Dollar Project. Wow! <laughs> so, <laughs> so the plan was to go in, work together for a few years, make a million dollars, and then I could, you know, resign, retire, and uh, write novels, and I wouldn't have to care if if you know anybody would buy them or read them. 24 years later, here we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So first, in that kind of respect, so first we, we did really well uh, with uh, um, finding a lot of good customers here. Uh, but then things change pretty fast. So uh, first, uh, Chinese factories, shoe factories became a lot better at going direct. And uh, the customers, they were only looking for the lowest price. So the space to work with uh, quality or design, it was shrinking pretty fast. So we thought, okay, long term, this is not going to be viable. If we you know, going to do something that we can stand for, uh, we need to start our own brand. And then we, uh, uh, we saw that our expertise was in, uh, in winter footwear. That's where we could add something of value. And then this... This was a, you know, a big uh, uh, happy coincidence. Uh, one of our Taiwanese partners found this uh, traction technology, uh, which a Canadian triathlete had developed and which was um, tested in the U.S. Uh, runners world. So he had a very, very rudimentary shoe, but the technology that he had developed in his own rubber factory uh, with dynamic carbide tip stats making it possible for him to to run and, and train all through uh, Montreal winter uh, we saw that okay this is not only for running but with this we actually have a chance to solve what is the biggest problem that footwear can solve in the winter time uh, the risk of slipping yeah. so that's how we started to build ice bag around this uh, traction technology going back to those early days I I would imagine there are, let's say, the the good and the bad of working with your with somebody in your family. So in your case, your mum. So when you reflect on those early days of Iceberg, what are the the best and the worst memories of those times? The best was that we we had a lot of fun, and uh, you know, it's <laughs> since this was never really or it didn't start as a serious project in that way. Uh, you know, you can kind of role play a little bit uh, with having a company and uh, and uh, being a, a business uh, person. Uh, 
uh, and then traveling a lot um, and but and there's this positive momentum around uh, creating something new uh, together uh, so that was very much on the positive side and you know the tough side was that very few people <laughs> believed in us so from the industry you know they thought that this would be very very a very marginal product and i think what got us going early was that as soon as we had products out we had a uh, uh, customer and customer feedback user feedback saying you know things along the line so f- thanks for making this fantastic product now i dare to go outside in in the winter time again when it's slippery and it's this very strong sensation that when you expect to slip but you get traction it's and we see that that's like the it's a key driver of recommendation for our for for icebug which still is reproduced over and over and over again and still it's the same a little bit the same feeling every year when when it's slippery for the first time and and you use the shoes and you remember uh, what it feels like it's pretty amazing this way so this was uh what was a very positive thing and then and it's very interesting building a company because it's i'm super interested in culture and I think culture is, is here we say that we have three main things that uh, that you will be not really measured by, but the, the three things that are equally important if you work at Icebug. One is uh, getting the job done, the second is developing, and the third is contributing to culture. And my work with culture has often also been in opposition to what I don't uh, uh, like. So when I worked as a journalist, uh, this was really a culture of, uh, you know, complaining about uh, everybody else, how, you know, how stupid, because I worked in the night time editing the the magazine. So then we complained about how stupid uh, the people working in the daytime were, or, you know, the graphics, how how stupid they were, or the um, photographers. Or, or or even the journalists writing because we were editors and of course everybody complained about how stupid uh, the the management was of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's really as you know you, you you're never gonna be able to complain and and whine uh, yourself towards a better uh, atmosphere <laughs> But uh, that doesn't stop people from trying, for sure. So that's one thing that I really didn't want to have. Uh, and then we figured that the project was, uh, okay, if you have, uh, if you surround yourself, you're going to be so much time at work. So it's more nice to surround with yourself with friends and people you like. So that's uh, what we did. And that's very good in this uh, care aspect. But what we noticed then, if you if you do this for a longer time, is that if you don't have uh, high enough uh, expectations, uh, also, then it's not uh, it's 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 not a nice culture after a while. High enough expectations in in what way? Uh, to to get the job done. Okay. Uh, so not just you know not just caring about each other but actually also having the candor to say okay now you need to get this done here and so that you contribute something uh, of value uh, together yeah absolutely yeah i think that balance is is key for sure yeah Um, not always easy to find the right balance though Uh, i think yeah being nice being a good person of course is important but i also think yeah for individuals motivation for their own drive you know that accountability that need to yeah be held accountable for something i think is is really important i i don't really like accountability because that kind of starts where responsibility ends so let's i'm I'm much more like you know if people really move into taking responsibility But where that fails, uh, accountability needs to be a place. But if we have expectations that people will take responsibility for driving certain things, and and uh, you know, that, that, so that we can create value together, that's yeah. a strong part. Yeah, 
Absolutely. That's what we're still trying to yeah. always uh, find the right uh, way in moving in this direction. Yeah. Well, I think, it, and it's an ongoing, I think an ongoing challenge. I'm not sure you'll ever find the, no, no, the no. perfect balance. Work, work will never end uh, unless you quit or die. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. And, and <laughs> culture is definitely something we, re we recreate uh, every day together. I mean, um, me and uh, and the rest of the people that that work here. Yeah. So Interesting. It's, it's fragile, but it can when it when it when it's good, it's really uh, it, that brings amazing. Uh, it makes a great place to work. So I wanted to go back briefly on something that you mentioned earlier on. You said that you had this opinion of yourself in the early days that you had this business savvy, so you were going to come in and help your mum create this uh, million dollar dollar business. So now coming from journalism, there's not necessarily a strong connection to, to running a business. So where, where did that confidence, where did that belief come from, from a business perspective? I always uh, had a pretty high uh, belief in my own potential to do different things. I think that's uh, um, the, the way I've seen myself, that I have potential to do uh, big things. Yes. And uh, it's it's not uh, because it took a long time for me to learn because the school was always very easy for me and uh, doing, you know, exams on general exams, the kind of which gives you, uh, you know, makes possible to enter university. Yeah. Um, I scored very high on those as well. So I always had but the problem is if you look too much towards uh, uh, seeing yourself as high potential and you, you, you're kind of very fond of that uh, self view as well. Mm. And you don't understand that you have to, uh, you know, stretch out so far. So some things you will fail with and also that you need to uh, put in single mindedness and perseverance and with some things you need to do the same things over and over again and put in the hard work. Yeah. Just potential is not enough if it's not uh, fulfilled and, and the way to fulfill it is to finding the proper uh, purpose and, and mission and have a direction and then work hard. Yeah. So it took a long time for me to learn to work hard and to uh, stick to, uh, to certain things and repeating those. Because it takes a while until uh, you know what you're doing and then you get tired of it and then you want to change to something else. But other people will not necessarily catch up until you have done that thing a couple of times. And is that something, that point around, I guess, your speed or anybody's ability to, to move quicker than other people, is that something as a leader of the business that you have to be sensitive to that perhaps you're already thinking about the tomorrow's challenge and people within the business are still focused on today's challenge. Is that something that you're, you're conscious of? This is really interesting because what we have as, as like the main, try to boil down as the main thing which we are working it is, is trying to making us future fit now or actually making sure that we are relevant for, for tomorrow now so we kind of work with here and now at the same time as as the long term uh, perspective yeah. but it's always a question and i don't think that's uh, just me but you can move very fast in 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 the thinking and concept uh, domain there's virtually no friction there sure. but then uh, you have to be very very mindful that whenever you want to take you know, concept and or an idea uh, and try to make it into uh, reality in an organization or in society or in the market, then often there is there is a lot of friction. Uh, I mean, not people working against it uh, necessarily, but just it's slow to get some movement and not to get frustrated by that, but sticking to this. And also in some cases, like, uh, so we first had uh, this organization I talked about where we were all uh, happy friends, <laughs> liking each other was the most important. Uh, you know, we had 45 minute uh, coffee break in the morning, okay. one and a half hour lunch, then 45 minutes <laughs> coffee break, something like that. You know, I'm 
it, sure. I exaggerated in a little bit, but you know, the the social part of it was very important. And then we grew to a certain level, and then we needed more, you know, structure and order. And you can't really share, of course. Being at the coffee table has a value because you share everything which happens. You get context. Uh, but then when you reach a certain size, uh, you have the possibility and and you need to kind of move to not everybody doing everything, but people having more clear uh, that they can do different things and they're good at that thing. So we moved into much more structured system with uh, departments and uh, you know job descriptions and setting targets and then breaking down targets uh, and doing target focus boards for each quarter and you know like some kind of uh, bingo uh, okay. thing at the monthly meetings and then we saw that this wasn't really serving us well because we ended up in, you know, in, in real silos where if some people would uh, uh, cooperate, they, it would be like the head of the department talking with the other head of the department and do we have resources and so on. Uh, and also a lot of, okay, this is uh, not market things job this is sales job and then pushing back no this is not sales job this is marketing's job so then we wanted to have a system which was much much more uh, based on okay what's the actual work we want to do and how do we create value and how do we collaborate in teams around that so we wanted to switch uh, towards a more agile or we started with scrum pretty strict scrum methodology to try to do this and then we moved into more agile as you don't you know you don't want to do scrum as doing scrum then that also becomes very yeah. orthodox but we want to have a more agile approach uh, to working and much more team-based and more focused around okay so how do we uh, collaborate to create value and then when we did this big shift that's that's like a case when it was so frustrating in the start because uh, nothing was happening. In that case, the best thing uh, you could do because people don't know if it's uh, if it's for real yeah. <laughs> and they're not used to the yeah. situation. So can I really move in and have the possibility to decide things? So you, you 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 give uh, the power to decide a lot of things, but not a lot of things happen still asking for decisions uh, so that's very frustrating but what we managed to do then which was very important is was keeping this space open so that people actually you know you try to move in a little bit and you realize that okay it's working i can move in and i can take a bigger role and drive certain things in a much more clear way than having to ask uh, uh, my boss about something so keeping space open, waiting for things that you want to happen to happen. That's it's a real test of, uh, of patience. <laughs> Whereas this, we have this idea, we're going to work this way. It's all in, in, in our heads is ready. But the, having it happen in real life is a slow process, yeah. which you have to allow to be slow. Uh, interesting and that's something that you still very much that's the way you very much work today yes absolutely okay. and also in, in a way of thinking about innovation and we, we don't have a big number of targets and we don't do these breakdowns anymore but the most important thing is that we have a clear sense of direction and alignment between the teams and then uh, uh, we try to have this model where we maybe don't plan very big uh, projects to make big steps, but to a lot of uh, uh, continuous innovations or improvements, uh, quick wins yes. that leads us in this uh, strategic, strategic direction. Yeah. So that if you see kind of a time line, each one is small, but if you see from two different times, then you see a, a real qualitative level of, of difference okay. uh, so that's how we try to approach innovation and, yeah. and plan work to try to do it uh, as small as possible but something which happens continuously 
that is, if I understand well, that then must also support the having a more sustainable approach to what you're doing because you're not you're not saying, okay, you know, this is what we have today, but this is what we have tomorrow, and it's completely different. So, yeah. it, so you're not uh, devaluing what you have today, tomorrow. It's it's really something that you know evolves over time, yeah. but it's still very relevant, yes. uh, still. Yes, it, and it's part of the learning process. So even if some things we did two years ago weren't, we wouldn't do them today. Uh, they still had uh, had value for us. Like an example of this is uh, is really how we have worked with uh, uh, sustainability or climate work um, over the past couple of years. So we started pretty much. Of course, we started doing proper sustainability works longer ago after we had the opportunity with the, the right size to be able to to ask our partners to do anything else than the standard uh, and also on based on this understanding of, of the art of a that we we are accumulating ecological depth so we have to be very resource uh, efficient or you know trying to solve relevant human needs with as low resource use as possible it's it's a fundament of what we what we how we think uh, sustainability needs to be approached but after this summer of 2018 when there was no rain we felt that we got to be able to accelerate uh, the climate work so then we decided that by 2020 we would be climate positive yeah. and did this as a public statement and, and to be sure to kind of tie ourselves to the mast we put it on the shoe boxes coming out as well and and when we decided we didn't really know uh what it would mean because we didn't yeah. have a clear uh, uh measuring of uh, of our uh, emissions yeah. and uh we didn't know what it we we knew that we wouldn't be able to remove all of it of course uh but we didn't know what compensation uh, would cost but that kind of sent uh, uh the organization into not only a few people that are normally the ones interested with sustainability, but the wider scope of the organization got very nervous, <laughs> proud and nervous. So they got to work and we did uh, um, a good first LCA of a, of a relevant product, which was uh, also a, a one of the biggest sellers. So we can assess what's the total impact. Uh, and then uh, we also found this well, in the UN platform for uh, offsetting or, or, or compensation, where it was much, much lower cost than we had expected. Okay. We thought, we, when we started, we, we thought, okay, this would be a, between 5 and 20 euros per pair of shoes. Yeah. Wow. And it's a big, big, yeah, big uh, gap. Yes. But it ended up being more like, you know, 20 cents or something like okay. that okay. so that cost is really nominal and when we did the full uh, compensation in in uh, in the un uh, um, offsetting platform they said okay it seems that you are the first uh, company in in your uh, in your business that are doing this we want to um, we want to acknowledge this uh, so it's Climate Neutral now um, published that we were the first climate positive outdoor footwear brand. Yes. And then that felt like a good narrative, but then the whole climate positive and climate neutral has the problem that people might think that, okay, it's it's fine, you know, it's it's compensated. Now I can uh, carry on with, uh, with business as usual. Yeah. So... We left that narrative. That's one thing we wouldn't do again. But what we learned in the process, we had this, you know, for, for one boot that we did 14 kilos of CO2 equivalent. Yeah. And then, of course, we were wondering, is this good or is this bad? And we saw that there is really no uh, uh, available benchmarking uh, data. So then we launched into the next thing, which was making this available for uh, for all of the line, uh, meaning that we do a light LCA for all products, and then we publish CO2 footprint, uh, percentage biobased material, percentage uh, recycled material, 
as well as all the uh, the production sites that has been uh, involved in, in the production yeah. tier one tier two tier three tier four so you can follow this uh, and that's accessible mm, with a qr code on the product uh, to to increase t- transparency and and make it uh, easy to understand and what we learned then was that a lot of the okay for some we have primary data but a lot of this is is secondary data, which means that it's averages taken yeah. from, uh, you know, the material sustainability I- index uh, database, yeah. and that's n- not very high quality data. Yeah. So a lot of the material stuff, okay, we know that some things are better than other things, but the actual footprint is pretty vague. Yeah. But what we could see was that sure emission reductions comes when we use less fossil based energy. So when we could switch processes to uh, not using boilers, so we don't use any conventional dyeing, for example, that has a, 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 that has a clear effect. And also switching to renewables uh, in the factories. Yeah. Yeah. So then we became part of a pilot program, which was about uh, installing or investigating if solar was a case for factories in Vietnam, where we produced. Uh, And that program where we could then, because we've always been thinking that it's a good idea and we know that uh, the grid electricity in Vietnam is 70% fossil based. So to switch from that is, is a clear, immediate advantage. But when talking to the factories, this is not their main line of business and you know they don't know vietnamese regulations they're often korean or or taiwanese and are not you know that into engaging in those things because it's difficult and they don't know uh solar what what is required and how much it can deliver and so on so but we managed then with pulling funds together to hire really good local uh solar or um, energy expertise and the pilot showed that yes the factories could get up to 50 percent of of the electricity from their rooftops and there were solar vendors that could install and finance this so if they if they write a contract where they buy this uh, electricity for um, 15 20 years then they don't need to make any investment they cut uh, emissions about in half and they will get a discount for electricity from the roof compared to buying it off the grid yeah. uh, depending where they are in the country between 20 and 35 yeah. percent and when we learned that that is possible then we teamed up with this best solar vendor because i scanned the whole vietnamese market and and uh, had um, 20 offers and we asked them okay so why don't we make this into a program and then we invited other brands and uh, other uh, uh, to, to to nominate their factories to this, because that's it's like a basic principle we have. Whenever we see a sustainability win, we think it's uh, it's our uh, obligation to try to share it uh, so that it can be scaled and not keeping things uh, proprietary. The recognition you received as the first business to uh, the first business out of outdoor footwear business to be uh, climate neutral yeah or even climate positive because we did 200 percent compensation i noticed that recently or in the last few years you're actually getting a lot of recognition you've won a lot of awards a lot of prizes you recently were awarded an entrepreneur of the year award is that something as a business that is that you particularly go after uh, those that that kind of recognition is there is there a strategy behind that or Uh, nope Okay. <laughs> it's an effect of doing uh, good right. things, yeah. So that must be a great uh, and, and then you have like an obligation to use certain platforms. So uh, we were entrepreneurs of the year in this West Sweden part, 
and this coming weekend is is the uh, the, the the final in uh, for all of Sweden, okay. which is in the same place as uh, where they have the Nobel Prize okay. <laughs> prize ceremony. So it's uh, at least uh, uh, it, it it doesn't have the same weight, but it's the same house. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, but if we would win that, then I think it's a very uh, important platform to talk about okay because this is an association of uh, for businesses that give this out and they talk about how businesses are very important for creating jobs and uh, and paying taxes uh, which makes it possible to build the commons and and that's very relevant but i think in this where we are right now and with the problems we face uh, businesses have an extended uh, responsibility we can't really pretend about you know externalities anymore. We have to take in our effect on society and uh, and nature uh, and take responsibility for that. Yeah. And I think that the only real future fit businesses are if we set our business targets in a way so that when we reach our business targets and where we are doing well, then the world is also doing well. So our business target that we have set now or kind of refined is about amounts of uses. We think that our contribution to people living better lives or to the world is primarily getting people outdoors more in in a in a together kind of way because that's satisfied some some things which we are really hardwired to to benefit from in in well-being physical activity uh being together with others and also connecting to nature so we think this has a value and then we want to work towards that value and then number of uses is is much more important than number of pairs we sell number of pairs we sell is one factor in this but there are two other factors the second one being uh, that actually the shoes need to find a customer who will become a user that they will use this product so that it doesn't just end up uh, in the cupboard or is you know the 40th pair of shoes that you hardly ever use and then the third aspect is is uh, durability that you actually will be able to use it for a long time so that combined would make uh, for uses and if we get more people out and then also do collaborations uh, to, to scale this uh, we think the world will benefit from this yeah. And then we need to do this in in a as resource efficient way and polluting uh, as little as as possible. So then, for the product, of course, this has to do with number of uses and also durability, and then also um, the the footprint in production. Yeah. But just the footprint in production isn't really that interesting. It's footprint per use for an activity yeah. which you benefit from that's that would be the real thing that's important to measure yeah in addition to doing the work with your co-founders to run the business you also uh, sit on the board of the eog and previous to that were chair of the um, scandinavian outdoor group when you you know you're obviously dedicating time your own time to to be part of these programs what's your drive and motivation for that and what have you got out of it so far what do you feel like you're getting out of it so i'm a very strong believer in the power of uh, collaboration and i think that uh, i mean the scandinavian outdoor group where i was for the longest uh, so far and it's it's a, it's a it's a testimony to that. There's a lot of really valuable work done on the sustainability side there. And then I also think that, uh, you know, of course, by contributing something to the common good, uh, we also benefit. And and there's this kind of trust, which has been, I would say, the, the Scandinavian secret sauce of uh, uh of uh, success uh, has been trust in our uh, societies and you can also see this in the Scandinavian Auto Group that brands 
they don't wait with giving things until they've seen that they have received more. They trust that if I give, I will I will also get. Uh, so I think that building on that is is very very important. And then uh, this might seem a little bit presumptuous, but I think that uh, the Scandinavian aspect of outdoor have something valuable to offer to the world. It's based in this uh, free uh, uh mindset where, you know, outdoor should be available for everybody. It doesn't need to be very extreme or, you know, it's about getting out. It's free air life if you if you just translate it okay. and and people have of course here access to uh, access to nature through the freedom to roam where we have access to to public land but the thing that you can try to integrate this really into your everyday life as a mindset and that also ties back to the uh, ecological philosophy yeah. Uh, on an S uh, and the Stettin the declaration and the belief that nature it's not only you know it's not only for us to use and the value of nature is not only you know whatever we can derive out of it but yeah. it has a, a, a value in its own right. I think those parts are part of the Scandinavian uh, outdoor culture and mindset and and i think that those are universally valuable these uh the projects that you're working on obviously here with building the brand and the you know the strong sustainability backbone of the business the work that you're doing with the eog and of course you have a well not of course but you have a family as well you have some true you have children so how do you manage to find a good balance with that and are there any let's say non-negotiable aspects to the way you live your life that enable you to to find that balance i never like to work too much <laughs> so so I, in fact i never know i think this is maybe an important uh thing to share uh, from a, like an entrepreneur point of view because you get all these crazy stories about sleeping under the desk and stuff like that i, I don't think i ever regularly worked more than let's say 50 hours per week more in line with with 40 hours yeah. because i always wanted uh, a certain balance uh, and it's possible to to build a business uh, that way apparently yeah, of course you need luck as well but uh, it, it's possible i also want to kind of set up every day so that uh, i get a good uh, uh, balance so you know you don't wait for the weekend or wait for vacation for everything to happen. So an important part of setting this up, I think, is that we do this uh, three uh, uh, well health hours per week. So 11 to 12, Monday, Wednesday, uh, Friday, uh, we close the office and uh, everybody go out to do some activity that they like. So... Some people run in the forest, some do more hiking. Mushroom hunting was popular lately. Uh, or you can go to, there's some outdoor gyms around here. And uh, football tennis is, is also quite popular. So some, uh, some game right. aspect of it. And that's, you know, for me and for, uh, for everybody that works here. Because fundamentally, I think I want to set up this place to work so that it's a place where I want to work. Yeah. And I want the people, other people that work here as well, to have the same kind of working situation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, physical activity and taking time for that, that goes a long way for uh, for balance. And then, you know, it's family life also balances you. <laughs> you have to be there. Uh, so... I also try to switch uh, uh, the mindset a little bit so you don't just have a long to-do list, uh, but rather try to focus on using the time I have uh, in the best way yeah. and prioritize. And then what I have time to do, it's what I have time to do. Yeah. Because, as I said, work will never end. You will never reach the end of, of uh, you know where you couldn't do more work yes. so you have to kind of block the time you want to work 
and then make best use of that time. Yeah. It's you know you can scale this to the life as well. Yeah. We have I believe we have one life. <laughs> it will end. Yeah. Uh so this also relates to what I value highest. It's not maximizing uh the amount of money but uh, actually using my time in 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 the best uh, way. It's so it's it's really it sounds like it's fundamentally it's a philosophy that you're kind of operating under it doesn't it doesn't sound like there's a particular rules that you you abide with it's just a, a philosophy that as you said you know my time is finite and you know i it's not even a discussion really it seems like he, it, you will find you will have a balance and you know you you basically act to ensure that that happens but i think it's tough for a lot of people to to understand how you how you achieve that yeah i mean it's uh it's simple but it's not easy yeah <laughs> it sounds simple <laughs> yeah no but it's simple but it's not easy yeah. <laughs> so it's uh I, I think this is i mean as culture and, and building your everyday life and you know a lot of things coming in lots of demands it's a constant uh is a constant train of steering that way and remembering what what you think is most important and also trying to uh, uh, to do as little as possible that I'm not the only one that can do because that would be, be what brings Icebug uh, most value. But I also use uh, some, I mean, I do practice a lot of yoga that okay. grounds me as well. Uh, I do try to spend uh, a little bit of time every day out in uh, in the forest yeah. that's also helpful no meditation mindfulness uh, approaches to thing there's a lot of different things you can do yeah. so a combination of trying to design uh, the workplace and, and you know different systems i work with uh, so that it's not overwhelming yeah. and trying to navigate and prioritize it's difficult, but yeah. manageable. Okay. I don't have any real. I, there's a lot of people who are much more, uh, uh, much better uh, at at the, the practical management of this than I am. But I I I manage to do okay for myself. Okay. And I try to steer by. I read a really great book this summer, which is called "The Inner Game of Tennis." Okay. Which is kind of the best uh, uh, non-Eastern uh, way of kind of approaching a, a yoga philosophy, I think. The approach to tennis there is very much about finding a state of uh, relaxed concentration. And if you can learn that in tennis, you can try to apply it to everything. And it's a lot about not having this inner voice uh, beating you up the whole time or even praising you the whole time, but actually focusing on, on the task at hand and trying to have a mental picture of how to do it and then finding the right feeling when the flow is going well, when you're performing well. And I apply that also to yoga uh, practice so I get into a position I know what it's supposed to feel like I don't think I do this I do this I do this I do this yeah. but I get into the position I know the shape of it I know what it should feel like if it doesn't feel this way then I start making adjustments yeah. and I think that I'm trying to apply the same for work okay. so when I'm really productive how does that feel and then yeah. I try to get into this shape and feel, use feeling to kind of fast uh, determine if I'm if I'm doing well or not. And if not, I adjust. So it's a really important factor for me, uh, the way I feel in the body when I leave work. Yeah. And oftentimes I feel stress in the body and then I know that I need to, I should try to... Uh, modify some things so that I leave work with a good feeling. It's the inner game, game of tennis. Inner game of tennis, okay. yes. Okay. Very okay. worthwhile to read. Pretty short, so okay. condensed wisdom. <laughs> Perfect. What would you consider to be your most important task as a leader of business, but also people? 
I mean, a little bit high flying. We have decided that we want to use the company not to maximize profit, but to maximize our uh, impact on uh, sustainable transformation. And our vision is to be a change maker for a society where people can thrive on a planet in balance. I think my most important task is to be the change I want to see mm. in the world. So if we talk about uh, that this should be a place to develop, that where people should be able to develop to their full potential, then I need to uh, be able to and be willing to learn and develop and also provide a space for that. And if I think that uh, the world needs a proper price on carbon, then we uh, should indeed uh, uh, put uh, that same fee on carbon in our internal calculations, which we have. And, and that's an ongoing thing. The whole making us future fit now, that's my main Okay. My main mission for people that work here, for people that are involved in the supply chain, for uh, customers that we want to be users and then uh, turn into co-creators of, of more sustainable lifestyles to uh, to inspire that. It really amounts up like last year's uh, Oscars winner, you know, it's this work is uh, everything everywhere all at once in a way. But we also have to try in this to identify what is our, uh, what are we uniquely positioned to do? Where can we influence most so that we don't don't really do everything? But we need to work in a lot of dimensions at the same time and focus on where we can have the most uh, use our platform to leverage things. So one example is we think we can use our platform to leverage the things with a bank. Uh, so we were part of, uh, and th that work we have done for four or five years. So that, you know, we have this discussion with a bank every time, how, what do you do so that you don't finance uh, fossil uh, fuels, uh, investments or, you know, um, companies that aren't aligned with 1.5 and also make sure that, you know, the default pension offering and funds that's not play. That's only placed in in you know deep green or at least green uh, according to the taxonomy. Those kind of funds, and then we could work with a, a green and cash action guide that we can then spread to other uh, other companies because a lot of companies have a very big part of their cost emissions from their money, and it would be one of the easiest things to work with. But it's easier if you have a clear action guide. Yeah, for than sure. Then if everybody have to start from scratch. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You've you've mentioned a couple of times um, the importance of developing people. Um, that I've read in the past that you know for you it's about finding that balance between obviously developing the business but sustainable transformation and and the individual personal development. So. Can you open up a little bit about, about how you approach this and also how you personally as well are able to kind of continue your personal development journey? To be clear about how I phrase this, I don't think that we can uh, develop people. It, it needs to be an invitation and a setup, which is where because development always needs to be uh, very uh, uh, voluntary. Okay. Yeah. So it's a, it has to be a free free choice, uh, obviously. Uh, otherwise, we it's more like brain yeah. <laughs> brainwashing. Yeah. So, but what we can do is, of course, to set up uh, to to encourage development, uh, have this as an expectation, and to set up the organization so that it's deliberately uh, developmental. So there are some aspects of this. One is we want to do development programs to be for everybody not just showing you know talents that would be for development because then you basically say to if you choose 10 percent for talent programs you basically say to the other 90 percent we don't care about you and that's not a good thing yeah. if you want to have a real team uh, in your company so it needs to be for everybody and to do it not by, you know, irregular stuff that which happens far away and that you're supposed to bring back, but to do it as close to your everyday situation as possible. So everybody here should have 
a role and uh, areas of responsibility and work they do that they don't fully master so that they have something to stretch towards and uh, can learn. And it's not a question about, okay, now we throw you into the deep water and see if you drown or not, but it's things to stretch for, uh, but you will have coaching, support, context uh, from from people around you, from the team or from more uh, from more senior people in the organization. Okay. So that's one aspect of it. And then we're also part of this uh, movement called Inner Development Goals, which came up as a, as a kind of response to, now we're halfway with the Sustainable Development Goals and we're not doing very well at all. Some even move backwards so we're not making a progress towards you know, a sustainable world the way we should. And this was, so the inner development goals is, is kind of a way of trying to address this because we know what needs to be done, largely. We know that if we don't do it, uh, outcomes will be very, very risky potentially catastrophic still we don't manage to 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 make the changes we need to do so this is like a way of researching okay what kind of inner qualities and skills do we need to make the external uh, changes happen and inner is then both in a person and in an organization uh, and then uh, from academia they researched what do people think are the skills needed for the sustainable transformation and then it's 23 of them and then it grouped in five different categories so one is being or relationship to self uh, <clears throat> second one is thinking then it's relating both to others and the world uh, fourth one is collaboration and fifth one is action and the way we approached this was that we did this. It felt like it was a natural progression for us because we did uh, first with, with an organizational developers, a psychologist, we did uh, leadership development. Then we did team development uh, based on you know research for what makes team work. And that's very much in line with an agile way of organizing. And then uh, next step felt natural for doing inner development because this was also a point when inner development had been very manifest for me which was you know during the first uh, couple of months of uh, of covid it was really uh quite you know we talked about this vuca world for a while <laughs> but the level of uncertainty and ambiguity uh during the first couple of months of covid was just Amazing, yeah, staggering, yeah, unprecedented. And a lot of things which were like, mm, you know, ready to start, uh, fast forwarded very fast. Uh, but what happened for me was that more or less, not really consciously, but I realized that I always played a role as a CEO, which is close to a, some kind of a Superman role in terms of, you know, you have the smartest questions and the best solutions for everyone, everything. Basically, you have a plan. And if we do like this, we're going to succeed. But there was no way pretending I had a plan that would, you know, determine the outcome. So you kind of had to embrace vulnerability and say that, okay, I don't know. We don't know. We, we got to be able to try to figure this out uh, together. And, and learn as we uh, go along and uh, uh, giving up on that knowing and um, you know conveying need feeling the need to to display this image of knowing and being in control embracing that vulnerability I, I think it was very clear to me that it made me feel stronger and it also made me more relaxed so I could participate more in joy uh, at work instead of thinking okay why people should be more serious and work and also expressing gratitude because in a, in a, in a it's it's pretty uh, i would say in a in a lutheran or protestant environment it's a little bit you f you feel the risk that if you say thank you people will get lazy but i learned that it's really is the other way around if you show gratitude 
people want to contribute more. So I learned through my development, I learned some things that uh, that were important and I think it made me more fun to work with. And uh, also I, it moved, it doesn't just happen at work because in a development, you it's in all dimensions. So I think I also became a more fun uh, partner and, uh, and dad uh, to be around. And the same thing here, if I benefit this way from inner development, I want to make this uh, accessible for all of, quote, my people or all the people at Icebike. And then uh, being moving from team development uh, and seeing what's, what's the next development we should work with and having had this experience for me and in related things for some of the other top management, we said that, okay, Let's try in a development goals as a framework for this and do it together with our, you know, trusted uh, organizational psychologist that we worked with for a while. So, and we divide the day, the, the year in 100 days uh, segments. So we said, okay, let's do one uh, theme per 100 days. So we started with being and then we moved into thinking, relating and so on. Now we're done one and a half years of this. So we start with making like uh, an introduction to this category, uh, see what research says, why is it good to have these skills, uh, and then give some, pr do some practical exercises. And then during the 100 days period, we have like every uh, two weeks, there's a one and a half hour IDG group meeting and then it's groups uh, where people from different teams are put uh, together and then basically you talk about if you have found some skill or quality to work on how you have worked on it or what your reflections are around yeah. working it <coughs> <coughs> sorry and learn by this kind of sharing really interesting uh I'd love to to uh, find out a bit more about that actually, but maybe there's a white paper out because okay. uh, we were one of the real pioneering organizations in this uh, to really try to work with it in practice. Yeah. So the Inner Development Goals organization they put out the out the white paper where we are okay. one of the examples. What's your favorite piece of sports or outdoor gear? And you're not allowed to say something from ice bug because that would be way too easy. Yeah, yeah that's easy. Skis. 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 What, uh, so what type of skiing are you, are you a cross country skier, downhill no, skier? No, no, no. Touring. So Alpine touring. touring. Okay. So I would go for, uh, something which is, uh, light enough to, uh, skin up, uh, but then, uh, uh big enough to have fun skiing okay. down. <laughs> Great. Sounds good. Now you already mentioned one book, but is there another book that you would recommend for somebody that's working within the industry to inspire them and, and, and motivate them to, to do better? There are a lot of uh, different books that have uh, inspired me. Some are more on the business side. I think that the whole framework, which is in this uh, Jim Collins book, body of work with good to great i think you can find that the roadmap online and then you can go into one of the um, one of the books that's been very useful for us as a kind of how do you um, create a, 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 a well working uh, business yeah that's a good one uh then i think also brenna brown has uh one book called dare to lead i think it's called uh that's about you know vulnerability and that kind of research. There's a book called An Everyone Culture about deliberately developmental organizations okay. by uh, Robert Keegan and uh, Lisa Leahy. And then there's also, I don't know what the book is called, but Half Earth, E.O. Wilson, the whole Half, half Earth okay. ID that we should keep Half Earth wild. What a great idea. Yeah, and then I... Uh, I Yoga philosophy is quite interesting as well. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's one called uh, uh, The Tree of Yoga uh, by BKS Iyengar. That's a good one. And if today was your last day here, what would your message be to the team? Like if I die or <laughs> if 
Right, I, 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 I'm not saying that. Okay. <laughs> Just if it was your last day. Uh, Maybe you die, I don't know, but <laughs> that's not what I'm <laughs> suggesting. I think I would say that it would be do good work. Okay, that's simple. And maybe then that'll connect to this question. So if you were to give future leaders um, in the sports and outdoor industry three bits of advice, what would those three bits of advice be? I think finding uh, the joy and passion in what you do and uh, be able to, when, when business as usual is destructive, to uh, to stand up against it. I think you're worth working somewhere which has a good purpose. And look for uh, a business model which gives value and where it's aligned so that when the business is reaching its its business targets and it's doing well, then the world is also doing well. The aim of this podcast is to really help people that are either are working in the sports and industry or would like to on their career path. So considering that, is there anything today that we should have talked about that we haven't or any question that I should have asked? I think we covered uh, a lot of ground. I think a lot of this is my uh, uh, personal thinking and uh, and ideas and motivation, and uh, and I think that's uh, it. Does you have you you need to find your own inner compass? I think that's an important thing, so that you can be in some way authentically yourself, and don't you know try to show up at work and putting your best side forward but creating a, a a culture where we can be people and bring our our whole selves to work because there are so many false divisions like you know that you would step into a professional role and then all of a sudden there's a, a, a set of morale that is a business morale and you you follow certain things which is right in a business context and you kind of leave what you think is are the right things uh, in in your in your personal life and this thing about externalities that you know businesses should look at profit only and you know you don't factor in uh, how you affect society or or nature uh, and we need to be our whole selves uh, at work also yeah absolutely great well i think that's a, a really good place to end on so thank you very much david i really appreciate your time i think you're uh, i think very genuinely that you're somebody that really inspires people within the industry so you know Please keep doing what you're doing. And as I said, thank you very much for the time. Super interesting discussion. I We covered less than half of my questions. So <laughs> maybe in a few years we'll come back and, or I'll come back and we can carry on the discussion. But, but thank you very much today. Thank you, Dan. It was fun. A joy. I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did. We love to read your feedback. So please leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks again for your support. See you soon. And don't forget to subscribe.